everything is going the way that you want it, but God is she ain't good. Glory to his name. In the book of Mark. Book of Mark. It's a familiar passage of scripture, although I must admit that it is a, a text that I myself have uh, never uh, preached from. The word of God is just, uh, the word of God is just awesome. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter uh, how much you read it, that it is loaded with revelation. Sometimes we get information, but amen, how many know that information is good, but revelation is better? Amen. And the word of God, sometimes we've gotten it, we've read it, we've got good information. But then you can read the same passage of scripture that you have read for years. And the Lord can give you a revelation. And uh, I, I'm not going to be long this morning. I'm not going to be long. If you would read with me in the book of Mark, chapter number 8. The book of Mark, chapter number 8. I do have a lot of notes, but I already know that I'm not going to uh, get to all of that. Uh, the book of Mark, chapter number 8. And I want you to read with me from verse number 22 to verse number uh, 26. Let's read it aloud together. And it says, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring him, they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the visitation of your spirit. And God, we pray that flesh will be crucified. God, that we hide behind the cross. We ask God that you would speak through these lips of clay. Lord, we ask that you would have your way. God, move by your spirit, for it is not by power nor by might, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. Oh, Lord, we ask today that you would have your way, that you would open up blinded eyes, unstop deaf ears. God, that you would move in the midst of your people. God, give us information and revelation so that, they can be, they, so that there can be transformation. God, we simply ask that you would have your way in this place even now. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Grab your neighbor's hands before you take your seat. And I want you to look at them since uh, we are dealing with a man in the text who is having uh, trouble with his vision. I want you to look at them right in their eyes. Just, just, just eyeball them. Look at them in the eyes. And say, neighbor, neighbor. take another look. Then turn to somebody else and just tell them the same thing. Take another look, another look. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. And if you would give me about 20 minutes, we'll, we'll be finished. In this text, primary character in any text, I can never state this enough, it's always going to be Jesus. Matters not whether it is Old Testament, New Testament, Amen. Jesus is always the center of attraction. When you don't see his name, he is there. And I'm trying to emphasize that because I want you to know that even in your own situations, that when you can't see Jesus, that Jesus is always there. Matter of fact, there's a song that says he was there all the time. He was there all the time waiting patiently in line. Amen. So even when you can't see Jesus, feel Jesus, sense Jesus, you need to know that Jesus is always there. Am I talking to anybody that sometimes you even prayed? You couldn't feel nothing. 
Amen. And I know salvation is a faith thing and not a feeling thing. But every now and then, how many know that if you're pregnant every now and then, you want the baby to kick? Y'all ain't saying nothing in here. And sometimes in your spiritual walk, amen, it seems as if you are going through the motions. You're coming to church, you're praying, you're fasting, you're seeking God, and you can't feel anything. So, brother pastor, what do I do when my salvation is not something that I can feel? You do a self-evaluation, but you have to know that even if I can't feel anything, Thing that my faith tells me that Jesus is yet on board. Amen. And, and so in this text, Jesus is named, he's the primary character of the text, but the Bible tells us that he is introduced to a man that is blind. What do you mean he is blind? He cannot see. His eyes are defective. There's nothing happening there. He can't see. He would have on dark glasses and a stick walking trying to feel his way. He is blind, but I'm here to suggest to you, amen, today that there is more than one blind person in this text. We have some people who walk in that did not have a seeing eye dog, did not have a stick where you were feeling your way, amen, have 20-20 vision, but yet you can't see. Touch a neighbor and just ask them, is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Uh, because sometimes uh, you can be blind in more than one way. Uh -huh. uh, visually impaired, visually impaired. Oftentimes we do okay in the natural, but what the Lord showed me is oftentimes we are jacked up in the spiritual. Yes, we can see people in the natural. We don't have any problem when they put the eye chart. The doctor says read the letters. We can read them X, Y, J, Q, Z. We, we, we go through that fine. But then you notice something that in the text, Jesus gives this man an eye exam. You don't have to believe me, but it's right in the text because after he does something for him, he explains and he asks him, he puts up a chart, so to speak, and he says, tell me what you see. And what he reveals that he sees does not line up with what actually was taking place. And the Lord showed me that some of the stuff that we are going through is because our outlook is jacked up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Our outlook is jacked up. Amen. If you're going to tweet something today, tweet this. You cannot change your direction and you'll, until you change your outlook or your mindset. Some of us are getting ready to, if the Lord delays his coming for a few more weeks, we're going to go into a new year. But the problem will be, just like all of the old years, is we are going to take an old mindset and an old outlook into a new year and get the same result. But I'm here to tell you that I'm is there anybody here that's ready for something new, that's ready for what God, amen, wants to do in your life? If it means shedding some of my own ideas, some of my own agendas, some of my own outlooks, I want to go into a new year and if things are going to be different, I've got to look different, walk different, act different, have a different mindset, same mind, same thing, new mind, new direction. Watch this. So, in the text, in verse number 18, if you would just peek back at that, Jesus is dealing with his disciples and he says something that is very deep. He says, having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, you hear not. Do you not remember? And what he was talking about is he was like, brothers, did you just see me work some stuff out? And now here we are a few days later and you act like you haven't seen or heard anything. And I'm here to tell you that that's really an indictment. This was not to the world but to the people of God. And it's an indictment on the people of God. We got ears but we ain't hearing nothing. We got eyes but we can't see. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What do you mean, Pastor? Explain that. I'm so glad you want me to. Amen. We hear what we want to hear. Are y'all hearing me? Amen. We hear, amen, a bunch of foolishness, but we do not have our ears tuned to the things of God. And sometimes we need to just go to the altar and ask God, tune me up, tune me up, tune me up. 
They could see, but they were not seeing the right things. They could hear, but they were not hearing the right things. I want to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that the enemy has attacked the eyesight of the body of Christ. I want to make that suggestion. Uh, not our natural sight, but our spiritual sight. There's a disease called presbyopia. And it is the loss or the ability to clearly see close objects or small print. Mm -hmm. And some of us are not able to see clear. There's another disease called floaters where these are tiny spots or specks that float across the field of vision. And in other words, we can look, and, and I know somebody said, well, Pastor, give me Bible. I got Bible. Some of us can look in the lives of others, and we can see all of this stuff, but we don't check out the floaters in our own vision. And since you got to have Bible, let me give you some. Jesus said, amen, you're trying to get a speck of something out of somebody else's eye. Why you got a beam in your own eye? Is there anybody here that is just telling the Lord, Lord, I need you to help me because when I get ready to step into what I'm getting ready to step into, I don't want to mess it up. So watch this. There's another disease called dry eyes. And the church is suffering from dry eyes. In other words, it is uh, the tear glands cannot make enough tears. And, and what do you mean we are suffering from dry eyes? Well, there used to be a time when we could come to the house of God and God could show us where we brought us from. Our hands would go up and we couldn't even explain it, but tears would begin to run down our face because we would say stuff like when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all, but now, amen, praise can be going up. It doesn't matter what happens. We sit here hard like a rock. No tears. I'm here to suggest we are struggling and suffering from dry eyes. Then, there's another disease called cataracts. Cataracts are cloudy areas that develop within the eyelids. We can see, but it's cloudy. Mm. We can distinguish things, but it's cloudy. When a cataract is present, watch this, the light cannot get through the lens easily. And as a result, vision can be impaired. I'm here to suggest that church has come down with a severe case of cataracts. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because the light, you do know who the light is, don't you? His name is Jesus. Because of the cloudiness, we can't see him properly. Okay, okay, somebody said, but you ain't hit me yet. I, I'm not finished. Glaucoma. It is a condition where uh, progressively deteriorates the optic nerve. And the eye automatically has some pressure. But glaucoma, uh, put so much pressure on it until it begins to affect the vision. And I'm here to suggest that many of us have spiritual glaucoma. The enemy through trials and tribulations has put so much pressure on us. It has affected the way that we see God and the way that we see each other and even the way that we see ourselves. But what I want you to know is I do have some good news. Most of this stuff is treatable. Most of it's treatable. Nearsightedness. 
means that you can see things at a distance, but things that are close are blurred. And I'm here to suggest that that's probably one, the one that affects the church the most. Well, why do you say that, Pastor? And give me scripture. I got scripture for you. Amen. How can you love me that you've never seen at a distance, but the people that you see every day that are near, you can't love them. Something is wrong. And the tragedy is, what God was sharing with me is the tragedy is some of the stuff that he wants to release into the life of us as believers, he cannot based upon our perception of what we see. Okay? You, 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 you don't feel me. You don't feel me. The license branch has enough sense that when you go down there and you want to get a license, what do you want to get a license to do? So that you can drive. Mm -hmm. So that you can drive. But they make you pass a test because they recognize if you can't see right, then you can't drive right. And there's some things that God has withheld from you because you ain't looking right. So he can't release it. If he releases it, you'll mess up some stuff because you can't see right. But I'm here to tell the enemy that whatever God wants for me, I'm ready ready for it. And I'm telling God, God, whatever you want to do, wash me, clean me, touch my eyes so that I can receive what you want me. You're not getting ready to drive if you can't pass the test. Oh, Jesus. Uh, watch this, watch this. Uh, so this man, this man, let me, let me put the medical stuff up because somebody like them, we preach, ain't preaching the Bible today. Mark's gospel is the only one that records this particular uh, miracle of Jesus. It's only found in Mark's gospel. Uh, Matthew didn't record it. Luke didn't deal with it. Amen. John leaves it alone, but Mark picks it up. And as Mark begins to deal with this, you will notice something in verse uh, number 22. First of all, the man is blind. But they do bring him to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to suggest that the best place for the lame, the hurting, the broken, is amen. We need to find a way to get them to Jesus. I've got a question, Deacon Perham. Has anybody seen Jesus? We've got to get them to Jesus. And so they bring the blind man to Jesus and they ask Jesus, Jesus, he's blind and we want you to check this out. Look at it. It's in, it's in verse 22. And they asked him to touch him. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Maybe they have heard about the woman that had the issue of blood for over 12 years that she touched him and she got healed. Maybe they have heard about how he took uh, two little fish and five loaves and fed the multitude. See, you got to understand that anything that Jesus truly puts his hands on, it has to change. You always know, saying nothing. And I'm here to suggest that that has not changed today. How can you tell if Jesus has really touched somebody the way that they used to walk? They won't walk no more. The way that they used to talk, they won't talk no more. When Jesus has really touched something, amen, it automatically brings about a change. How do you know, Sloth? Because one day he touched me and all the joy that filled my soul. What happened? Something happened and now I know. What do you know? He touched me and he made Is there anybody else here that can testify that one day the Lord touched you? Amen. He touched you, didn't deserve it, but he touched you, you wasn't even looking for it, but he touched you. Watch this, I'm almost finished. So they said, Jesus, they got him to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, we just want you to touch him. Now this messed me up because Jesus does not do the same thing every time. Did y'all hear what I said? Jesus does not do the same thing every time. Do y'all agree with that? Do y'all agree with that? Jesus does not do the same thing every time. He does not move the same way every time. He does not move the same way 
every time he I know somebody says but brother preacher I, the Bible said that he uh, is the same yesterday today and for yet yes he is the same but he does not do the same thing every time and I just want to suggest to you if he doesn't do the same thing or move the same way every time why do we keep trying to do the same thing the same way every time Jesus is always he was always moving. Y'all do know that, don't you? See, last week when we did dealt with the text, last week he was in Jerusalem. Did y'all know that? This week, amen, the text said he coming to Bethsaida. Jesus was always on the move. And sometimes we're looking for Jesus where he was trying to do what he used to be doing and he's still doing it but he's doing it a different way now. And I'm just telling the Lord, Lord, I don't want to be in the way but God, I certainly want to know what you're doing in this season because I don't want the Lord to do it without me. Listen, I love riding horses. Your pastor likes to ride. First lady and I, we like riding horses. Says we like going horseback riding, but you will never ever pull up to the church and see a little stable thing out there for me to ride a horse up. I am not riding a horse to church. I ride a horse, amen, for pleasure. But there was a day when you could come to the church and you find people's horses tied up. That was good. That was the day that they were in. But how many know that that day is gone? And if you want to stay in that day, you will miss what God is doing in this season. I'm here to tell you that God is yet saving, yet delivering, yet making ways out of no way, but he does it a different way because some of the old stuff was good in that season, but the season has changed, baby, and there are some things that you can't do out of season. None of that in the notes won't cost you nothing. Watch this. My wife will quickly tell me, and she'll tell me, uh, you know, that, that, that color, you know, it's not the season for that color. Or, you know, that kind of suit, is, that's, that's, that's not the season. Uh, well, my response is, I don't have seasonal clothes. Uh, or let me, let me re re restate that. I don't have seasonal suits. Whatever suit pastor got, I wear year round. Now, that's just, that's just me. That's just me, you know why? I don't have tailor-made wool suits and all of that stuff. But wouldn't it be crazy if you saw somebody in the summertime and they got on a full-length coat and a fur hat I love y'all dead animals that y'all wear to church. You know, I didn't see that many of them down the end of that. Y'all got some bad dead animals up here. And when you live by the lake, you need some dead animals because it's cold up here. But it would look strange if you came, amen, to church in July and it was 100 degrees and you were walking in your fur coat and, 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 and you had your scarf and mittens on. Matter of fact, if you walk too far, they probably have you incarcerated in somebody's hospital because they would know that something is wrong with you. Why? Because you were doing something out of season and sometimes we try to do stuff out of season and make that last forever but you got to know when to turn the page. You got to know when the season is changing and I'm just trying to tell you we're getting ready to go into a new year. It's some season, some season I get ready to change and I don't want to miss God looking for God where he was and not finding him where he is. Look at this, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta finish. I gotta finish. We, we, I'm amazed, we like change until it comes to the house of God. Uh, I remember when the microwave came out. First, nobody, they was, first of all, they were so expensive. And most people didn't have them in our community, praise the Lord. Then they start saying, you know, uh, uh, no, nah, you microwave that food, it'll kill you. You know, all the, that's, uh, that's what they say. But then when they got affordable where everybody could get one, now people won't even buy a, a house if they looking at a new house and it ain't, where the microwave at? Oh, I ain't buying no house if it ain't got a microwave. We, we like those niceties in our homes. Uh-huh. 
Black and white TV. Y'all remember black and white TV, though. Some of y'all remember black and white TV. And, and you're looking at one of the original remote controls right here. One of the original remote controls. What do you mean by that? Because my parents, could, I could be upstairs in my bedroom. My dad could be downstairs two feet from the TV. Hey, boy, come here. You come down there. Yes, sir. What do you need, dad? Turn that TV. Are you kidding me? Yet one of the original remote controls. Well, no remote controls back then. The kids were the remote control. But watch this. Now anybody, everybody in here, if you got a TV, you got a remote control to that TV. Are y'all hear what I'm saying? So why is it, hey man, you didn't mind life catching you and more conveniences at your house. But then when you come to the house of God, you want it to be like it was 200 years ago. All I'm trying to tell you, same God, different message. We still gonna preach the gospel, but we've got to, amen, get to a place where we understand what God is doing in this season so we can reach this generation that's running around with their pants down around their knees. Listen, people of God, I might as well close this. I ain't gonna get to use it. I can stay saved. It don't matter whether you sing the gospel rap, old hymns, any of that. My salvation is secure. I know the man for myself, but what about the ones we trying to reach, we've got to make it conducive enough when they come to the house of God that they can hear God relate. In other words, we've got to show them Jesus. Anybody see Jesus? We got to close. Watch this, watch this. So the text says that they bring the man to Jesus. That's good. That's good. And they expected Jesus to touch him Jesus messed him up. He takes the man by the hand. Y'all don't believe it. I think it's in verse number 23. Takes the man by the hand. Leads him out to the edge of town. He does lay hands on him. Oh, I'm good with that part. But then Jesus does something that's out the box. He does something that's unconventional. Right in the text, what does he do? He spits in the man's eyes. I better, I better open this back up because somebody ain't gonna believe me. In verse number 23, took the blind man by the hand, led him out of town, and we had, where he had spit on his eyes. See, there was another occasion where he spit on the ground made some spatter and put that, this ain't that. I told you, he, he, same result, but he used different methods. And sometimes we trip on the method, I don't care how he does it, just as long as he does it, and Jesus steps out of the box and said, I'm gonna heal you, but ain't, that, ain't nobody ever been healed like this before. Lord, how, how many know that God knew that man, amen, this man better be blind, because if I had a toe ache and he get ready to spit on me, it might be some problem. But when you've been blind long enough, you don't care how God does it. Just as long as God does Somebody say, do it for me. Do it whatever. You got to do, do it for me. So Jesus, he, he spits on his eyes. Mm, mm, mm. But watch this. He get, I told you, he gives him my eye test. He gives him my eye test. Watch he says, he says, uh, ask him if, in other words, how, how can you see? How, how are you seeing? He lay hands on him. Don't worry, now when we have the altar call, I don't plan on spitting on them. <laughs> but he spits in his eye. <laughs> and he says, now how do you see? Man opens his eyes. Jesus has touched him. Jesus has spit on his eyes. And when he opens him and looks up, he sees men, but He's yet not seeing right. He sees better, but he doesn't see right or correctly. Did you catch that? 
he see, he's, he's been touched and he's better, but he's not whole. And sometimes what God is trying to show us is when we come to him, it's an ongoing process, brothers and sisters. We come, we see better, but we still may not see it clearly. And so it's an ongoing process. Watch, watch this. So he says, he says, he says, watch, watch what he says. He says, oh, I see men. But they, 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 they trees walking. The trees walking. And, and, and I said, man, God, what, what, how can you see men as trees, but they're walking? Huh. So I looked at this. I looked at this. When you look in, in, in the old tabernacle, in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, many items of the tabernacle were wood overlaid with gold. Mm -hmm. The wood denoted the humanity. Gold represented divinity. So, so, so watch this. So he sees men as trees. That is wood. But watch this, watch this. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 through 8, we see another man with a tree. Mm -hmm. You find, we talked about it Wednesday night. You see Adam, what is he doing? God is walking, his voice is walking in the garden. That's how bad your God is. He, he said, Adam, his voice leads him, puts legs on and starts walking through the garden. Says, Adam, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And Adam is hiding. Where is he hiding? Behind the tree. Mm -hmm. See, there's a picnic significance with men and trees. Uh, Nathaniel in John 1, 45 to 51, Jesus is having supernatural knowledge and he calls Nathaniel in whom there's no God. And Nathaniel is a sincere man, but he's under a tree. Okay, y'all still don't believe me. Let me talk about another man. There's a, another man by the name of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus, don't you? Amen. Little four foot something that people overlook and he couldn't get to Jesus. So what did he do? That same man and went up a tree trying to seek God. Okay, y'all still ain't uh, getting this, so let me go to one more. There's another man uh -huh, in, in, in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 3. He told us to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water so that we would not be moved. Now how can I forget this? My salvation came by way of a tree. There was another tree on Calvary that, amen, one man died in sin, one man died to sin, and one man died for sin. It was Jesus that died on a tree. I'm telling you that trees do have some significance but this man I said I see men but I see them like trees. Okay brother pastor I see that I see that now you help me with the tree thing but uh, what does that have to do with me? Well I'm so glad that you asked such intelligent questions and on my way to my seat I have to leave you with this. Amen. It is how you look and how you see others that can determine what God is going to do for you. Uh -huh. You don't believe me. You don't believe me. Let me call a few witnesses here. You remember the spies don't you? There were 12 of them sent out by Moses to spy out the Canaanite, the prime promised land. It was promised. Who was it promised to, Pastor? It was promised to the whole nation. And watch this. They were supposed to go to verify what God said, but amen. Instead, they go and give their own opinion. Watch what the text says. They were supposed to go. Moses said, I'm going to send you to see what the land is, if it be as God said it was or not. So they were supposed to go and verify what God said. What did God say? I'm going to give you a land that floweth with milk and honey. That's what God said. So they go and they don't just verify it. They verify it. Everything that God said is going to be there. It is there. But watch what they say. They say, but the land has giants in it. And then if you look at the text, I believe it's Numbers chapter 13. If you look at the text, it says, and we were in our own eyesight as grasshoppers to them. In other words, they are suffering from what they seen. It has produced in them Lord self-esteem they were not looking right but check this out how can 12 men go 10 of them see one thing and two of them see something else and I'm here to suggest that there are going to be some people that leave here on this morning some of you are going to see it one way but some others are going to see it another way listen to the same word sit on the same pew listen to the same service praise in the same song but some people will receive it one way and some people will receive it another and I 
not here to suggest what you get and what you receive is going to be based on how you see it. How do you see it this morning? Do you see the glass half empty? Do you see, amen, how big, amen, the job that's in front of you is? Yes, I suffer with that. I look and I say, God, I see a big old elephant, but guess what? I got some hot sauce, I got some mustard, I got some salt, I got some ketchup, and I'm willing to cook this little elephant and eat it piece by piece. Yeah, it's a big job, but how do you do it, Pastor? Here's what keeps me going. I see how far I've got to go, but every now and then, you just need to turn around and look and see how far he brought you from. Is there anybody here that can say he brought me from a long way? Yeah, I got a long way to go, but thank God he's brought me, he's taught me, he's kept me, and I've come to, I'm too close right now to give up, to throw him that I've got too far to go. So how you see it can determine what you receive. If you change your outlook, the job that you want, the spouse that you want, the favor that you need. Some of it we put on other people, but some of it is simply based on how we see it. Okay, I can't get a witness. In 2 Kings chapter number 6, verse 17, Elijah, the man of God, is there. He's there with his servant. They look out, he looks out the window. Elijah looks out the window, and then Elijah goes back, sits in his lazy boy, kicks his feet up, and he chills. His servant looks out, everybody say, the same window. He looks out the same window and he panics. What's the problem? He says, oh, they're going to kill us. The army is out there to kill us. And Elijah prays. And Elijah says, Lord, open up his eyes. Then he goes back, looks back out the same window, but he has a different perspective because now not only does he see, amen, the situation and the enemy, but he sees God, he has a revelation and God reveals, amen, what else is there. And sometimes we're so busy looking at the negative until we fail to see the positive. And when you can start looking for the positive, then watch God work in your own situation and in your own life. The man of God said, God, open his eyes. And I'm praying today, God, open up our eyes. Let us see who we really are in you. Open up our eyes so we can walk right, talk right, love each other right, treat each other. Open! I gotta finish. And so here the man looks up. He sees men, his trees. He sees better. But he's not correct. And Jesus put his hands on him again. And watch this. And made him look up <laughs> you don't see this happening nowhere else in scripture if it would have been us some of us this man would not have gotten here because we would have kept trying to do it the way we've always done it he said no no you gotta, you, if you're going to get saved you got to sit in the chair but what if they couldn't find the chair no, 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 no. If you're going to get saved,